Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar entitled Advancing Patient Management, the Role of Genetics in Cardiovascular Disease. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Doreen Saltiel. My name is Michael Chapman and I'm a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch and I'm going to serve as moderator uh, for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Doreen Saltiel. Dr. Saltiel practiced functional medicine and cardiology in St. Louis with a focus on preventative cardiology, utilizing advanced functional testing, micronutrient testing, and other non-invasive technologies to decrease cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. She also served as medical consultant to the Metabolic Medicine Institute and co-director of graduate education program in integrative medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Saltiel practiced interventional cardiology for more than 20 years. She completed her cardiology fellowship at Walter Reed and served 14 years on active duty in the Army, culminating as the Chief of Cardiology at Eisenhower Army Medical Center and was the Southeast Region Cardiology Consultant. She also completed advanced fellowship training in metabolic and nutritional medicine from MMI and MMI's advanced certifications in cardiovascular health and endocrinology. Doreen holds a medical degree from New York Medical College and a Juris Doctorate from the University of Missouri Columbia School of Law. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage all of our participants to let us know of any technical issues you're experiencing so that we can try to assist you, as well as any clinical questions you have throughout the webinar. Please type these issues or questions into either the chat or questions boxes, making sure to send them to the organizer at any time during the webinar. We will be compiling your clinical questions and answering as many as we can in the final 15 minutes. One of the most common questions we get asked during the webinar is about availability of this presentation and the slide deck. These materials will be available on our website within a week of the webinar. If you're interested in having these resources, please click the Clinicians tab on the home page where you will find access to our webinars under Medical Education, or you can also log into your MyGDX account to find these webinars. If you do not have a MyGDX account, please click on the Getting Started link on our home page. And now I'm going to turn over control to Dr. Saltiel, and again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. I thought that at this point in genomics and the advances in genomics that this would be a good time to talk about the common genomic markers that you will see if you do advanced lipid testing or should order if you evaluate cardiovascular patients. By the end, my hope is that you'll have a better understanding of the most common polymorphisms, APOE, LP little a, and we'll touch a little bit on MTHFR. Additionally, the importance of the HPA axis and the gut on the development of cardiovascular disease is key to addressing the patient's lipid abnormalities. And at the end, my hope is we'll get to a case study this webinar is for all of you. So I will stop at the 30 minute mark to get to the case study and be more than happy to continue this at uh, another time. Firstly, clinical pearl. If you take nothing else away from this webinar, the most important thing is, is that vascular disease is a chronic inflammatory disease. So if you don't address the underlying inflammatory burden, you're not going to correct their risk for a cardiovascular event. When I think about how to approach a patient, whether you're using the functional medicine model of antecedents, triggers, and mediators, or whether you have your own process, I think it's really important to look at systems biology and the interrelationships of the uh, organs and systems and hormones. So when I think about the energy system, I think about the interrelationships of the thyroid, the pancreas, and the adrenal glands. When I think about the immune system, 
I think about the gut because 70 to 80% of the immune system is housed in the gut. I think about the gut brain relationship. And then I tie that to their pretest probability of vascular disease. And of course, people need to be able to detox. If you can't rid toxins, you're never going to rid the inflammatory burden. And hormones are important, not just for the obvious, but for the brain, the heart, and the bones. Women need estrogens, men need testosterone. So what are some of the common stressors that trigger the inflammatory response? Well, there are sleep issues, life stressors, all infections, toxins, heavy metals, and probably the most common is the inflammatory diet. So if you look at whatever the stressor is, the brain says, oh, I sense a stressor. You get activation of both the sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone renin system, which then triggers the HPA axis, which ultimately can lead to increased gut permeability because cort corticotropin-releasing hormone and cortisol both tell those tight junctions to loosen because they need to absorb as many macronutrients as possible because in essence they're sensing a stressor running away from a white tiger that's a normal response the liver releases glu glucose the pancreas releases insulin and you get ongoing energy production however when this becomes the new norm and it is maladaptive, what happens is at the end, you wind up with increased oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species. And as you see, the vascular effects are hypertension, uh, coronary disease, uh, cardiac dysfunction, whether it be initially diastolic and then systolic, because they're both on the same continuum, or atrial or ventricular dysrhythmias. When we talk about the epidemiology, you all know it's the leading cause of death. And despite the recent decline in death rate due to new technologies, new drugs, cardiovascular disease still accounts for 40% of all deaths in the United States. When you look at what we've done with technologies and drugs, you can see that on average, whether you're looking at secondary prevention, high-risk individuals in the primary prevention arena, or asymptomatic individuals, you see you have about a 30% risk reduction. And what you see is that there's still about a 60% residual risk. And that's where I think as opposed to traditional medicine, which I practiced for a very long time, functional medicine really has a role. This is where we're looking for the underlying root cause of the inflammatory burden. Genomics plays one of those roles. When you talk about genomics and you talk about polymorphisms, they are really very common. Every person has about 3 million SNPs. The issue is their genetic predisposition and then the environmental influence that will lead to the degree of penetrance as well as the expression. We're going to talk about APOE. LP little a, and we'll touch on MTHFR. As you can see, there are many other cardiovascular SNPs. APOE is really important as a modulator of how we handle lipoproteins. As you all know, it's synthesized predominantly in the liver, but I want you to take note that APOE is also synthesized by macrophages and adipocytes. Two pathways, the exogenous pathway via the gut food you eat, and then the endogenous pathway via the liver. 
I'm skipping these and we can come back to them because I think a picture speaks a thousand words. Now, I drew this picture. So um, what it is, is the exogenous pathway is on the left. You take in dietary fat. Chylomicrons are synthesized in the gut and then they're released into the circulation. It's in the circulation where they acquire ApoE. Chylomicrons with ApoE then undergo metabolism by lipoprotein lipase. And as you see, lipoprotein lipase is found in the heart, skeletal muscles, and adipose tissue. Lipoprotein lipase acts on that chylomicron and breaks it down into free fatty acids and chylomicron remnants, which still have ApoE. The free fatty acids then are transported to adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. And the chylomicron remnant with the ApoE attaches predominantly to the LDL receptor and other similar receptors and are cleared by the liver. When you look at the endogenous production of VLDL, it's synthesized in the liver. ApoE attaches in the liver before it's released into the circulation. At that point, VLDL and ApoE can either be again uptaken by the receptor or lipoprotein lipase can act on it become intermediate density lipoproteins and then go on to form LDL. Additionally, either the intermediate, intermediate density lipoproteins or v VLDL will generate free fatty acids, which are again picked up by adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. Macrophages, on the other hand, release, synthesize ApoE and they take up extra um, chylomicrons or whether it be remnants so that they can take them out of the vasculature. And if we go back, you will see that that part of ApoE on macrophages then helps HDL, which also has ApoE, remove cholesterol from atherosclerotic lesions or the vasculature to prevent the formation of foam cells. In general, ApoE3 is the most common, ApoE2 is the least common, and ApoE4 occurs in about 15% of patients. Let me go back as an aside and tell you about a case. If you see a patient who you see has elevated lipids, LDL, triglycerides, and you go through the normal process of placing them on omega-3 fatty acids and some of the other nutraceuticals you may use, and then you check after two or three grams in three months, and you see their triglycerides are sky high and their liver enzymes have gone up, in essence, simulating fatty liver, think about lipoprotein lipase deficiency, okay? It can happen with as low a dose as two grams of fish oil, which takes me to the next point is don't just put people on fish oil and not monitor the effects of that fish oil. It's not just in ApoE4 individuals that you have to be careful. It can be in other patient populations. Okay, back to lipoprotein binding. ApoE 2 and 3 preferentially bind to HDL, where ApoE 4 preferentially binds to VLDL. ApoE 2 really has a defective binding affinity, whereas ApoE 4 and 3 bind with similar affinity. So you have 
ApoE3, HDL, ApoE4, VLDL binding to the LDL receptor with the same affinity, and as you know, ApoE2 is less. However, when you look at plasma concentrations, ApoE4 4s compared to ApoE3 3s have a lower concentration. And the thought is, is that ApoE4 undergoes a higher rate of catabolism because it has a higher affinity for the receptor and VLDL rapidly converts into LDL. ApoE secreted for macrophages is atheroprotective, even though it has no effect on plasma lipids. It prevents the, the fatty streaks from forming foam cells. Just a bit about ApoE22. It's not very common, and it's type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. And the important thing about this is that you have to be a homozygous carrier. However, less than 5% of E2E2s actually develop type 3 beta hyperlipoproteinemia. And that's because of environmental factors, diets, and pretest probability of disease. I would be remiss if I didn't mention ApoE and the brain. Um, ApoE regulates lipid and glucose metabolism, and it's responsible for neuronal signaling. ApoE is synthesized by the astrocyte, where it's transported to neurons and then taken up by the LDL receptor. When studies looked at individuals who were ApoE, again, these are homozygous, 4-4, and the associated Alzheimer's disease, in those post-mortem brains, they found a higher level of oxidative stress. That shouldn't be surprising, given ApoE4 has a lower affinity for amyloid plaques, and therefore the clearance of amyloid plaques is decreased. Another study, however, looked at mitochondrial dysfunction because part of developing Alzheimer's disease or part of the pathophysiology surrounding Alzheimer's disease is mitochondrial dysfunction. And in one study, they looked at E44 individuals both without Alzheimer's disease and with Alzheimer's disease using PET scanning to look at mitochondrial function, i.e. utilizing glucose metabolism. And what they found was in those individuals that were E44, and these individuals were less than 40 years of age, they had the same PET scan pattern as those individuals who had documented Alzheimer's disease. So they're looking at this technology for the future as identifying individuals who may be at high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. ApoE in general is anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. Again, it is isoform dependent. E4 is the least anti-inflammatory and in fact has been shown in a number of studies to increase pro-inflammatory cytokines. It responds differently than somebody who is ApoE2 and or 3. So they have higher plasma, sorry, they have greater intestinal absorption, they have lower plasma levels, and they're pro-inflammatory. It's important to recognize that in addition to what we talked about earlier about lipoprotein lipase deficiency, individuals who are ApoE4 who are supplemented with fish oil, and in this one study, it was three grams of fish oil, had worsening of their parameters. Now, 
This study did not look at advanced lipid testing. They looked at the traditional lipid testing. When they compared it with individuals who are APOE3, they obviously did not see the lipid panel uh, worsen. In individuals who are APOE3, quercetin has been shown to decrease blood pressure, TNF-alpha, and curcumin is the best antioxidant and anti-inflammatory that gives you the biggest bang for your buck. And it in APOE3 individuals, it has been shown to increase ATP levels. So what do we do for APOE4 individuals? Well, there have been some studies that have looked at the progression of cognitive decline, and they found that alpha-lipoic acid, acetyl-L-carnitine, improved cognitive impairment. The biggest studies were done in mice. Interestingly, they find a higher demand for vitamin E, and they have increased intestinal absorption of D and calcium. And just like all individuals, regardless of APOE isoform, physical activity improves cognition, improves well-being, and decreases inflammatory parameters. So just here's a summary slide of all of what we talked about. And let's talk about LP little a. When you look at lipid disorders in general, there are four categories. There's those that are categorized with elevated LDL, those that are categorized with elevated triglycerides, those that are categorized as decreased HDL, and those with elevated LP little a. Most of the cardiovascular risk when we talk about lipoproteins is associated with ApoB. VLDL, IDL, LDL, and LP little a all carry ApoB. HDL does not, and there is no data to date that raising HDL improves cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. That doesn't mean I'm not saying that we shouldn't optimize HDL particle number because we should because of reverse transport and the ability to metabolize and clear oxidized lipoproteins, but raising HDL in and of itself does not change cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. APOA, on the other hand, is very atherogenic. It's synthesized in the liver, docks to LDL, and forms a bond with APOB. This is not the same LDL that is derived from VLDL metabolism. This is a newly synthesized LDL and ApoB. LP little a in general hangs around the plasma longer than LDL. And part of the reason is, is that ApoA attaches to LP little a near the LDL receptor binding site and potentially interferes with receptor binding. ApoA is atherogenic, ApoB is atherogenic, so LP little a in general carries the majority of the atherosclerotic risk. Nobody knows how it's cleared. The LDL receptor doesn't play a big role because as we've been told and looking at case studies, statins have been shown to increase LP little a despite their known role of increasing LDL receptor sites. PCSK9 inhibitors also increase LDL receptor sites, but they decrease LP little a. So it really is not from uh, clearance via LDL receptors. When you look at LP little a, 
and ask the question, does it enhance risk prediction when it's added to traditional risk factors? If you're talking about the Reynolds risk score, which looked at age and sex, diabetes, tobacco, the presence of, or absence of hypertension, total cholesterol, HDL, a history of premature disease, and CRP, they found that adding LP little a to those markers reclassified individuals 40% of the time from intermediate risk to either low or high risk. LP little a is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. The absolute risk is at a level of greater than 30. However, that risk starts to rise at levels of 24. So in my patients, when I see an LP little a of greater than or equal to 22, 23, 24, I know that their risk is already increasing. I don't wait till it gets to 30 to address it. So then you ask the question, how about if you have an optimal LDL, an LDL of less than 70? Will an elevated LP little a still increase the risk of a cardiovascular event? And the answer is yes. And again, I remind you that they didn't look at LDL particle number. They just looked at LDL. When you look at the Jupiter trial, 32, almost 33% of individuals had an elevated risk even with an LDL of less than 70. When you looked at the AIM High study, an LP little a of greater than 125 in one subset of population had an 89% higher risk of an adverse cardiovascular event. Now, AIM High looked at niacin, which is one of the options for decreasing LPA, and they didn't find a difference uh, in the lowering of LP little a and risk. Part of that reason is, it, is that there weren't enough individuals and the study was underpowered to really determine the benefits of niacin. When you look at APOA, uh, APOA is derived from the plasminogen gene. However, we don't usually have to worry about whether or not there's more plasminogen or more LP little a. It always exceeds uh, LP little a, except in those individuals where you're looking at LP little a's of greater than 100. And here's why, because it competes for the receptor, the plasminogen receptor, in essence, that you have an increased risk of clotting. Again, I mentioned that LPA quantitatively carries all of the atherogenic risk of the LDL particle. And in fact, it's more atherogenic than LDL because it has ApoB and ApoA. Most of what's on LP little a is oxidized LDL. So when you talk about genomics, Elevated LPA has been shown to mediate vascular events. It is the most genetic marker that's associated, it's the most potent genetic marker associated with coronary disease. When they looked at individuals who did not express APOA, they had a low cardiovascular risk. Now, our traditionalist peers only measure LP little a once. And that's because of its genetic component. Functional docs shouldn't do that because you can lower LP little a with interventions that decrease oxidized LDL. Now, in somebody who's got a genetic SNP, in, their level may not get down to 7, 10, 12, or 15. It still may be 25, 20 
but it will come down from 100 as opposed to those individuals who don't have a genetic SNP, theirs may go up to 40, and those are the ones you can get down to 12, 7, 10. So I urge you not to just measure LP little a once. When you measure it, I urge you to address the underlying root cause of the inflammatory burden and then remeasure because it is an independent risk marker. It is a risk in all racial groups. African descent individuals have the highest LP little a, and you can see uh, from the text that it uh, is less in uh, Caucasians, Hispanics, East Asians, but clearly the expression is variable. When you look at LP little a in statins, there is no prospective definitive study that says giving a statin elevates LP little a. However, when you look at current published reports, there is a very strong suggestion that you will increase LP little a by anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. And in one of these reports, albeit small, they looked at, <coughs> excuse me, individuals pre-treatment, post-treatment, and they found that ApoB increased by uh, 24 percent and LP little a increased by 11%. Clinical Pearl, if you're using statins and you see you're not getting what you want, think about it being attached to most of the oxidative burden being attached to LP little a, and you will not get that full effect if you use statins alone. Just some current therapies, niacin will decrease LP little a by 19 to 40%, PCSK9 inhibitors by 20 to 30%, those are very expensive, and estrogens decrease LP little a by 15 to 20%. Antisense oligonucleotides nucleotides are the newest to the market, mypomericin is an antisense oligonucleotide to ApoB, and as you see, it will decrease LP little a. However, you still have atherogenic ApoA. In trials currently are AC ASOs to ApoA, and in the preliminary studies, they found that it decreased LP little a by greater than 80%. So this clearly is on the horizon for those with the genetic predisposition as well as other individuals who have uh, resistant uh, LP little a to other current therapies. Again, here's just a summary. Briefly, MTHFR. What I want you to take away from this is that it's not just giving people methylated B vitamins and folate. It is much more complicated than that. As you know, SAM is the universal donor. SAW inhibits, SAM going to SAW inhibits most methyl transferases. And there's this very delicate balance between SAM, SAW, methionine, and in individuals who have high methionine, who have high SAM, what's going to happen is it's going to go down the transsulfation pathway. So, hmm, there it is. If you look at the methylation cycle, and this is a bit complicated, what I want to point out to you that certain SNPs in certain enzymes will impact therapy. So if you see somebody who has an elevated homocysteine, it may be because of other reasons other than just uh, SAM and methionine. If you see somebody who has a low homocysteine, really low homocysteine, they may have a SNP in that CBS 
enzyme, which typically increases activity down the transsulfation pathway, going to glutathione, taurine, that they still may need methionine, they still may need B12, folate, and zinc or magnesium because a lot of cofactors are important in this cycle. So again, don't just knee jerk and think homocysteine, methylated Bs, and folate. You just want to evaluate the entire methylation and transulfation pathways. Again, transulfation is from homocysteine to cystothionine, cysteine, glutathione, and taurine. Now, in somebody who has a lot of toxins, just as an aside, they may go down this pathway because of glutathione and the need for glutathione for detoxification. Again, when you think about methylation, you should think about thyroid hormone. Thyroid requires methylation, BH4, to make thyroid hormone. When you think about neurotransmitters, the making of neurotransmitters requires BH4. And clearly the blood vessel, when you go from L-arginine to nitric oxide, requires BH4. So methylation is very important for blood vessel vasodilatation and the making of neurotransmitters and hormones. Equally as important is the breakdown of those things. COMT is a methyltransferase. And if you have a SNP in COMT, you may not be able to methylate your estrogens as well, which can lead to an increase in 4-hydroxy, which increases the likelihood or the incidence of DNA damage and the potential risk of hormonally driven cancers. Additionally, going back, you absolutely need COMT to break down neurotransmitters. So even if you can make them, if you can't break them down with a COMT SNP, you're going to have activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And then just some additional information. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about LDL particle number. When you look at LDL versus LDL particle number, LDL particle number is a better risk indicator than your standard traditional LDL. You've all seen this picture for the same number of LDL particles. You either can have big fluffy LDL or you can have small dense LDL, which are the most atherogenic with the same LDL number. LPPLA2 is produced primarily by monocytes and macrophages. It is specific for vascular uh, inflammation. And LPPLA2 is very dynamic. It is where it is associated or who it's associated with depends on the environment. In somebody who's got a lot of oxidative stress, it's going to be associated with LDL. In somebody who doesn't have a lot of oxidative stress, it's going to be associated with HDL. Again, with a lot of oxidative stress, it'll also be associated with um, LP little a. When they've looked at atherosclerotic plaques, uh, when you do atherectomy and you pull out atherosclerotic plaque and it undergoes pathological examination, you find LPPLA2 both in the fibrous cap, along the edges of the fibrous cap, and of course in ruptured plaque. LPPLA2 is associated with increased cardiovascular events in healthy patients, i.e. no risk, those with metabolic syndrome, and in those with coronary disease. But once again, there is no data that says lowering LPPLA2 will decrease event rates. 
Caucasians carry higher LPPLA2 than other ethnicities. 10% lower in females thought to be due to estrogens. Many polymorphisms, some increase the activity, some decrease the activity. So before we get to the next section, if I had to pick three markers and three markers only, I would pick LDL particle number, LP PLA2, and LP little a. If those were the only markers that I could choose, certainly in addition to CRP and homocysteine, which you can get at most traditional labs. So these three are really going to tell you about, number one, the inflammatory burden in the vasculature, number two, the degree of oxidative stress, and the amount of oxidized LDL, which is really the precursor for atherosclerotic plaque. And again, all of these things will lead to the earliest marker of vascular disease, which is endothelial dysfunction. All right, so let's do a case. This is a real patient. She's a 47-year-old female whose father died at the age of 47 from a massive heart attack. She's a lawyer, only sleeps six hours a night, and her diet is sad, mainly fast foods. Her bowel habits are irregular, and she's still cycling. She's mildly overweight, mainly with abdominal obesity, with a waist circumference of 37. Her blood pressure is mildly elevated at 145 over 90. Fasting blood sugar is 120. Her fasting insulin is 16. Her hemoglobin A1C is 5.9. And her adiponectin, which I will talk about, is 10. Thyroid hormones are without antibodies. Her vitamin D is 30 and her pregnenolone is 80. Those were the pertinent lab findings. Adiponectin is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. It is inversely related to the degree of oxidative stress. So if you remember when you look at the insulin, glucose, and adiponectin uh, chart or curve as fasting insulin goes up, as fasting glucose goes up, adiponectin goes down. But if you see somebody who has a low adiponectin and their glycemic parameters are optimized, look for toxins. That is a poor man's oxidative stress marker that you can easily get in blood. So I looked at her HPA axis because, as you recall, if I don't correct her underlying HPA axis dysregulation and her gut, I'm not going to be able to address her lipids. And what drove me to do an assessment of her HPA axis is her stressful job, and she only sleeps six hours a night. And not surprising, her cortisol curve looks like this. Key, she doesn't sleep well. Look at her morning cortisol and look at her nighttime cortisol, which really is a prognostic indicator when elevated for hormonally driven cancers. Morning, night. DHEA is low, not surprising because of the degree of HPA axis dysregulation and the amount of oxidative stress. DHEA is an anti-inflammatory. It is a hormone of well-being. And in patients, for example, with lupus, they will use high-dose DHEA as an anti-inflammatory. And because of her irregular bowel habits and her sad diet, I went on and looked at a GI effects, and she said to me, Doreen, I came to you because my dad had a heart attack and died. Why are you asking me to do a gut test? 
And I explained to her, if I don't correct the underlying dysbiosis, because 70% of the immune system lives in the gut and address her poor sleep hygiene, I was never going to decrease her risk of a vascular event. Calprotectin's normal. As you see, her fecal secretory IgA is elevated, giving you a hint that there's some barrier disruption. And as you can see, she's got two potentially pathogenic bacteria and a candida species. And so that needed to be addressed. When you look at her advanced lipid markers, it shouldn't be surprising that her particle number is elevated. But look at her screening lipids. Nobody would go any further in their traditional world other than this. So it's really important that you look at particle number LP little a. Now, lipoproteins are part of the innate immune system. When they sense a PAMP, a pathogen-associated molecular product, or a DAMP, a damaged-associated molecular product like oxidized LDL, the common cause of oxidized LDL is the SAD diet and glucose, they will go out and try to protect the organism from this pathogen. How does it do that? L HDL goes out first like little Pac-Man. LDL follows suit to try and rid the offending object. But as you see here, her particle HDL particle number is low. Her LDL size is low, but her LP little a is elevated. Just a note about LDL size. LDL size is only important when your particle number is abnormal. In somebody who has a normal particle number, less than 1,000, less than 700, LDL size is less of a risk indicator than with an elevated LDL particle number. You see here her LPA is elevated above that 30 mark. So indeed, she's at increased risk. Her C-reactive protein is elevated, as is her homocysteine. So again, she's got a reason. She's got potential pathogens in her gut, and she's not sleeping. When I looked at her genomics, she was a 3-3 and she is heterozygous for C677T and A1298C. C677T, you think about more of your thrombotic risk. A1298C, when you have this genetic SNP, it impacts the ability of COMT to act efficiently. So when I put together what I did, we talked about sleeping eight hours, meditation, we talked about coherence training, and gentle exercise. I didn't need to stress her HPA access anymore, so just gentle exercise. Dealt with some adaptogens, some low-dose DHEA, a multivitamin, and of course magnesium. When I looked at her diet, we talked about increasing her good fat, decreasing her carbs, because carbs is, is what causes cardiovascular disease because of the spike in insulin, a moderate protein, mainly plant-based, and of course, gluten-free, dairy-free, and more importantly, yeast-free. For her LDL particle number, I gave her a little bit of omega-3s, CoQ10, and I started her on some low-dose niacin. I didn't give her any curcumin at this point or quercetin. I started the niacin at very low dose and worked my way up. For her homocysteine, I gave her methyl Bs and methyl folate initially. And I certainly will check that when I go on and do other testing, which over time would have included a Nutraval to look at methionine, glutathione, and some of the other uh, markers that were notated in the methylation and transulfation 
uh, pathways. For the potential pathogens, I treated her with Bactrim times 10 days. I gave her nice statin for a couple of months for the yeast. And then I gave her oil of oregano and, of course, probiotics. I told her to separate her probiotics and the uh, antibiotics and nystatin by a couple of hours. So, in four months, she comes back. She now is sleeping eight hours. She is still tired, has no energy, hasn't changed her job. Uh, her diet is yeast-free, gluten, and dairy-free. Bowel habits are now regu regular, and she's still cycling. She lost 15 pounds just by doing that, and now she was normotensive. Her fasting blood sugar came down a little. I was surprised that her insulin, hemoglobin A1C, and adiponectin didn't change, and her vitamin D with vitamin D supplementation got better. I was surprised to see that nothing happened to her HPA axis. I was shocked. I would have thought that by sleeping eight hours and at least changing her dietary habits, I would have made some impact. Nothing changed. And her lipid profile, nothing changed. Nothing. So when I see this kind of a pattern, I then start looking for toxins. So what did I think and what did I want to do? I then started taking a, what I would call a toxin history, which now I do on a regular basis initially. Back then when, this first, when I first saw this patient, uh, it was relatively new to me. Yes, yeah, she's had mold exposure. She had a water leak and obvious mold and they just cleaned it up and it never got fully addressed. I asked her to do a visual contrast test whereby when you have neuroinflammation from mold or other biotoxins, your ability for visual contrast is the first to really be affected. Uh, I ordered a C4A, a C3A, a TGF beta 1, and a NutraVal. Now, Lyme typically, with a C3A is sky high along with the C4A. Mold, typically you only get an elevated C4A and C3A is low. She flunked her VCS test, so I knew that she had some kind of exposure to biotoxins. The question is, how active is her immune system? Her C4A was 11,550. Her C3A was normal, and her TGF beta 1 was 15,000. In individuals who have this high of a C4A and TGF beta 1, those are the individuals with biotoxin illness who are most susceptible to end organ damage, like pulmonary hypertension and right heart dysfunction. I did her genomics, and she came out with a multiple susceptibility to molds, biotoxin, other Lyme, and uh, other biotoxin illnesses. Her DQ2, DQ8 was negative, and uh, she had no CBS SNP. Uh, her NutraVal showed that her nutrients were optimized, and I didn't need to replace any of those. So now what did I do? I basically cut back her exercising totally and told her that she can walk. The first line of treatment for biotoxin illness is cholestyramine, where you want to bind those toxins, and you slowly titrate up to four packs a day, either two hours before or after food, and remediation of the environment. I didn't change any else in her regimen. She was still on two grams of niacin, balanced omega-3s, CoQ10, um, and all of the other things that she had previously been on. I asked her to come back 
at uh, six months and and she got labs and lo and behold without doing anything else other treat other than treating her biotoxin illness her ldl particle number came down her hdl particle number went up in other words her immune system was no longer hyper vigilant her lp little a came down her crp was still a little little elevated but better and all the other numbers came down now that homocysteine of 10.2 for me is not optimum. I look at a homocysteine of six to eight. But at this point, I left her alone and continued on our merry course until her VCS test was normal, which it was. Her home was remediated. I backed off on the cholestyramine, backed off on the niacin, just kept her on omega-3s, and she's now on well call and continuing her therapy. And her house has been remediated, and she is a happy camper. So the bottom line is you got to address the root cause to decrease the inflammatory burden, the oxidative stress, and decreased cardiovascular risk. Most importantly, what I want you to take away from this is you can give somebody all the nutraceuticals and drugs that you want. If you don't address the underlying cause, they're not going to get better. So addressing cardiovascular risk means addressing the HPA access. It means addressing the gut and if necessary, infections, toxins, or anything else that you may find. So, oh, I went backwards, sorry. Now, those are my kids. And uh, as I tell everybody, this is not an easy course for those of you who are beginners but it's definitely worth it. And I think I have prevented more coronary events doing this type of medicine than I did with stenting and giving patients the traditional ACEs, betas, statins, aspirin, and whatever, uh, Plavix, clopidogrel, uh, any of those other antiplatelet agents. So at this point, uh, before I hand this back over to Michael, I just want you to know that there are targeted treatments that are there for you. And I'll just run through two slides. One is nutrient depletions that are common when you give people drugs. And then as you'll see, there's a whole list of them. If you want to address total LDL, particle number, particle size, and it goes on and on, and they overlap a lot. So get the biggest bang for your buck. And at this point, Michael, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Doreen. Uh, just have maybe a minute or two for a couple quick questions. Um, one question came in, Doreen, do you have an ideal range for adiponectin? Yeah, it's actually based on BMI, but I try to keep individuals at Dipinectin about 20, 22. Okay, great. And then another question um, I think would be really helpful. Uh, question about, do you have just sort of a best practice list of labs that you would run just kind of initially on a cardiometabolic patient? Yeah, I can actually, Michael, it, put that together and somehow get it out to the group. I always start with a CBC, of course, and a CMP, and I always get a GGT. A GGT not only tells me about liver function, it tells me about glutathione stores. And you really want your GGT in the lower quartile. You don't want it to be at the median or high point because then it is an independent risk marker. When I look at uh, advanced lipid markers, I always get an LDL particle number, an HDL particle number, an LP PLA2. 
I sometimes get a myeloperoxidase, not always. And the reason is, is because the data on asymptomatic individuals is very weak. So if I have choices, I will get, of course, LPPLA2, I'll get fibrinogen, and then I will get whatever genomic, of course, I get homocysteine and I get CRP, but I can put a list together of the things that I think are key to assessing cardiovascular risk. And I can also put the same list together for biotoxin illness. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and in the interest of time, uh, we'll end our question and answer period there. Uh, for additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website at www.gdx.net. On this site, you'll find sample reports, kit instructions, and other information for all of our profiles. And after taking advantage of the materials found on our website, feel free to contact client services with your questions. You'll see a number on the slide for US and UK customer service. Additionally, please call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialist to answer questions related to our testing, including choosing the right test and reviewing patient test results. And finally, uh, we'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on www.gdx.net. Next month, we have our very own Dr. Christine Stubbe presenting on updated guidelines for assessing and treating SIBO. And thanks again, Dr. Saltillo, for a great presentation. You're welcome. I'll answer any questions that uh, come in, and I'm more than happy to go over advanced lipid testing, just doing case studies, if that's something that would interest people.